So most of my work was focused on US energy systems and for transportation, for electricity. And over the last two years, I've gotten really interested in developing countries. Um, and there's a lot of work going on in, in China. Uh, MIT has a big China initiative. There's a lot of work going on in India. So my interest has been more on South America and Africa. So I'll be talking a little bit about that. And I'll be just giving you a lot of numbers just to like frame the problem. One of the things I've been struggling with the meeting is how, what do we mean by the last 20%? Uh, do we mean the last 20% of emissions um, in developed countries, or is it global? And how, how much is the target moving? When we're talking about 20%, that's a moving target, and by how much? Um, because the last 20% globally might be in eliminating the first 100% in developing countries. Um, so that's a, that's a tough start. So, uh, the total population in 2015, according to the United Nations, was 7.4 billion globally. China and India, everyone knows, are the largest, uh, have the largest population. Um, but that's not going to continue. That, that trend is not going to continue. In fact, population in China is going to start stabilizing, um, while population in Africa is rapidly growing. By 2050, the UN projects that Africa, the population in Africa will be 2.5 billion people compared to 1.67 billion in um, China. So by 2050, the population in Africa will be double what the population in China is currently. Uh, and then by 2100, it's close to 4.4 million billion in Africa alone. Right. So South America or Latin America, um, I, don't know, I don't know that many people in North America realize that the population of Latin America is do almost double the population of North America. Uh, Brazil has 230 million people. Uh, so, and South America is also one of those places that is expected to grow um, in population. Um, so then, the problems in all of these countries are very different, though. And so I have more numbers, a lot of more numbers. <laughs> I think that's it. So let's talk about electrification rates. Wait, yeah. Um, so in 2012, which is the last year for which the World Bank has data, the electrification rate in um, South of South Saharan Africa was 35.3 percent. In um, Europe, percentage of people are grid or what's that, that is percentage of population that has access to electricity, regardless of quality. So you could, if you have access to electricity two hours a day, it counts as you have access to electricity. So how that, that's how the World Bank defines access to electricity. In North America, um, the value is 100%, as is in Europe. And then South Asia is 78%. So, and North, uh, Latin America is like um, 97%. So in terms of electrification, uh, South Sub-Saharan Africa is where all of the growth in electrification is going to be growing. And we saw that by 2050, it will be $2.2 billion in Africa. And so we are at 1.1 billion. There are only 35% of the people have access. So the number of people that will require access is just going to dramatically increase. Uh, over the next, it's now 35 years, right? Uh, so that's a dramatic increase in the need for electricity. Um, and I will come back to talk a little bit about electricity and some of the work we've been doing on these, but I wanna show you some more statistics because while we have talked about electricity and we have touched on transportation and other issues, um, I wanna touch on those others as well. So urbanization rates, uh, so in 
so the percentage of population living in urban areas. What do you think is the um, urbanization rate of North America? 95. It's 82%. I was surprised, actually. 82%. Um, What's the definition? The percentage of population that it lives in urban areas. Uh, so I think it's cities of more than 100,000 uh, people. This is rural. I, this is probably rural. I don't know what the population is. Oh, yeah. So in Africa, it's 39%. Asia is 46%. I'm surprised by Europe. What do you think, Europe? The I Europeans. Mean, the definition it might be low because they have small cities. Yeah, so 74%. Yeah, see, that doesn't make sense. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> you, you can take sorry, it. We can, you can take it with the UN. Take yeah, it up with the UN. Uh, and then Latin America is 80%. Um, and Oceania, how do you say that? In English, yeah, so 72%. So that's in 2015. By 2050, they think it will be 50, they expect 54% of the population in Africa will live in urban areas. So that's 54% 54, 54 of the 2.2 billion expected to live in Africa by uh, 2050. In the U.S., it's also in Asia, it's also expected to grow to 60%. Um, the others remain pretty constant. But so, what do we need to build in Africa alone? That means that the number of people living in what they call urban areas will go will grow to 1.35 billion people up from by 2050, up from 470 million today. So, how much concrete? and still are we gonna need for this level of urbanization, right? And so cement is about 8% of the global CO2 emissions right now, 6%. So what is this gonna do? What is this move from um, population growth in urban areas? The other thing is while there's still gonna be a lot of urban population, in Africa there's still going to be about half of the population living in rural areas. Africa has basically a very limited electricity system, like a central grid. So how are we going to be, provide electricity to all of the people that are going to be in rural areas far from the grid, right? Um, what technologies are going to be available? Uh, so that's urbanization. Um, then it, there's transportation. So this is vehicle ownership, so it's number of vehicles per thousand people. What do you think it is in the U.S.? 800. It's 800, yeah. So what, in Latin America, it's 185. In Asia, including China, is 88. What do you think it is in Africa? Not that low. 35. <laughs> okay. So, again, what happens if we go up to the level of North America? How many vehicles are we talking about? How much fuel? And if we want to go to electrification of transportation, what, how much electricity is that going to be in a place where there's limited infrastructure to start with? Right? So, um, Again, this is, what do we mean by the last 20%? Um, and then the last one is the carbon intensity. And this is um, tons of CO2 emission, uh, per metric tons per person. So, 
So what do you think it's in North America? Yes. 17. Where's that? 17. Um, so South, Ameri um, South America or Latin America is 2.9. South Asia, which uh, is 1.2. What do you think it's Sub-Saharan Africa? Oh, the Middle East drives it up. What do you think is with the Middle East? 21. No, still lower than in the US. <laughs> Six. The, it's Middle East and North Africa. Okay. And so what do you think it's in South Sahara and Africa? It's 0.8. So what were total emissions um, in 2014? Does everyone know that by heart? 36 gigatons, right? If, if, if Africa gets to the level of Latin America, so not even to, the, to like North America, if they get to the level of Latin America, that will be 7.25 gigatons of CO2 by 2050. And currently, its total, it's 36. Right? So this just comes back to what do we mean by the last 20%. And so the problems are different, and I wanted to talk about the, the two that I've been interested in. So in South America, Brazil is a population of 270 million people, one of the fastest growing economies before the chaos of the recession and political um, scandals. So demand for electricity was growing. And it's still growing, just not as fast. 75% of electricity in Brazil comes from hydroelectric power plants, which are a carbon-free source of electricity. It turns out that they have run out of all the good reservoir uh, locations. So they are moving towards the uh, Brazilian Amazon. Belo Monte is one of the largest reservoirs, hydropower projects under construction in the world. It's in the Amazon. The Brazilian government um, has plans, like the official energy plans, call for, hold on, uh, 18, I think, hold on, 18, no, 26 hydropower plants in the Amazon by 2030, with a capacity of 44 gigawatts and a reservoir area of 9,000 square kilometers. So we can debate, I mean, people may have different opinions about building in the middle of the Amazon, um, but we did a study looking at what it means to build reservoirs in the Amazon in terms of carbon emissions. These are not carbon neutral systems. These are tropical reservoirs with heavy carbon loadings, um, and these reservoirs are very big. Even though they're not pumped storage, they're not doing storage, they're run of the river hydro projects, but there's still, they're still a large reservoir involved with that. And so that means there's a lot of methane and CO2 emissions. And it's in the Amazon. I mean, I, I use, I mean, to me personally, the idea of building these massive infrastructure projects in the Amazon just for ecosystem services and other purposes just doesn't seem right. So with a student, we started looking at what options are there available for Brazil to not build in the Amazon. And so Brazil has wind. It's in the northeastern part of the country. Brazil has an integrated power system similar to what the US has. Um, and so we were looking at what if, you, if they replace those hydropower plants in the Amazon with wind in the northeast of the state. And it works, you, they can do that. Um, and you see, as you start adding, we looked at a pathway. We had to look, we didn't just look at the picture of what it would be in 2030, we looked at what the pathway would have to be and looked at a, a schedule for deployment. And as you add wind, you see a decrease in emissions. Uh, but after you get a certain penetration level, the emissions start increasing because you have more cycling of the thermal power plants that remain in the system. We're talking about 2030 here, so this isn't even like long term, 
But what these results suggest is that Brazil is not even meet, able to meet their own plans for reductions of emissions that they put out for COP. Uh, so they're gonna see, they have proposed the reduction in emissions by 2030 and they could actually see an increase because reducing emissions from systems that are low carbon, it's just very difficult. So in Africa, the problem is very different. Uh, there are places, I mean, we saw 35% of the population have, has access to electricity. So there are, there are billions of people, millions of people without access to electricity. Um, how are we gonna provide that access? The Sustainable Energy uh, for All, which is a program by the United Nations, calls for universal energy access by 2050. So how are we gonna provide electricity for all those people? For all those people and all the other things that I mentioned? There are opportunities, right? And so what role do all of the technologies that we spoke about in this uh, meeting uh, play in these countries? And maybe Africa, there is not enough infrastructure. They're starting for, from scratch. Can we do technology transfer? There are places in Africa where they pay a dollar per kilowatt hour of electricity. So when they're paying that much, does that mean that there may be possibility for, use, for starting to deploy things that you could never deploy in the US because they're very expensive. Can we deploy CCS? South Africa has nuclear power plants, so does Brazil and Argentina. Can we do nuclear power in, this, in developing countries like these ones? Um, hydrogen, or we talked about systems of systems, right? Designing systems that link the transportation with the electricity, with industry, um, and then a carbon infrastructure is Africa the place to start developing and thinking about those systems of systems? Um, so I think I'm out of time. Um, I just wanted to throw all these numbers at you. You could have gotten all those numbers yourselves, but I put them together for you to maybe this is something to keep in mind for everyone. Um, I'm going to spend the next academic year in Rwanda, uh, working, trying to understand how mini grids work and whether they can actually provide quality power that supports economic activity. Um, in starting to do this research, something I have realized is a lot of the efforts in these, in these parts of the world are very ad hoc. Founding, founding organizations are putting money in these and building projects, but no one is tracking what is going on, what works, what doesn't. Um, and there is still very little academic research in these, um, in these issues. And I feel like if we're really gonna tackle the first 100% of the developing countries, which could be the last 20% globally, the academic community really needs to get engaged and start looking at how the solutions we've been talking about here could work in those contexts. Okay.